After 10 weeks of growing in his cutting-edge hydroponic system, Dave's marijuana is ready to roll. It's a little lighter than now, but I was anticipating. It all about it came out pretty, pretty decent. It's perfect BC bud. Clean, organic, and potent. After trimming, he'll put some aside for himself and his friends, then package the rest in half-pound bags for market. Dave is proud to show off his bud for the camera, but he's tight-lipped about where it's going and who's buying. Pot moves across the country just like peaches or potatoes, driven by supply and demand. If you had a big truck with a ma mass amount of marijuana and you wanted to sell it, what you would begin to do is you'd go north. The man in Edmonton and Fort McMurray is always huge because wherever you've got oil and gas workers, you've got a lot of men, you've got lots of money. There's not much to sell in Winnipeg. Manitoba is self-sufficient. And in fact, they tend to ship it down to North and South Dakota. And then when you get to Ontario, because the economy is so poor now, there's less people buying it and there's more people producing it. And in Quebec, their market almost exclusively goes to the Northeastern United States. The most expensive place in Canada for pot is St. John's, Newfoundland. It's $20 a gram, but marijuana is very scarce there. With Grand Forks perched right on the 49th latitude, it's no surprise that local growers have long been in the export business. In the old days, smugglers followed trails up on Phoenix Mountain, originally made by rum runners in the 1920s. This is the border. That's the big swath that they cut for uh, enduring prohibition to make work for men. And uh, that's all there is in terms of security, uh, barbed wire fence and a whole bunch of wilderness both ways. This has certainly been a popular place to cross over in, in the past. You can see there's not much of an impediment to just walking right over there. For years, it was so-called ground pounders like Mel Bell who did the heavy lifting. They were paid $300 a pound to carry marijuana across the border in hockey bags. I guess it's just like espionage, going into the enemy camp and making sure you can get in and out without being seen or found. All your senses are attuned, time stops, and you go through that window, and then it takes about two weeks just to de-stress after that. What was once proudly called the longest undefended border in the world isn't anymore. Today, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security scours the boundary night and day with surveillance cameras, ground sensors, and unmanned aerial drones. That has been lingering in the area. Of I happen to believe 9-11 was a kind of watershed uh, for the marijuana industry in Canada because of the nexus that uh, the Bush administration was able to draw between drug trafficking and terrorism. With tighter security on both sides of the 49th, exporting BC Bud entails new levels of risk. One man familiar with the challenges is Patty Roberts, who's flown this stretch of the border many times. Ten years ago, he was charged with being part of a smuggling ring that flew thousands of pounds of marijuana into the U.S. Well, uh, certainly the border, which we're coming up to straight ahead, uh, has uh, become more challenging because of 9-11. Um, a uh, much stronger presence on the border to try and uh, stop uh, surface infiltration into the United States. After the smuggling charges against him were dropped, Patty Roberts worked with Brian Taylor for the marijuana party. How are you, Brian? Good, how are you, Patty? Not too bad. <laughs> All right, well, let me get my gear out of here. All right. These days, he serves as a self-styled marijuana consultant, making use of his inside knowledge. No, it's nice to show up at an airport where they don't shoot your tires out. <laughs> the way Patty explains it, the key to the distribution network is the gatherer. They pay cash to the growers. So the growers aren't really aware that they're sending marijuana to the United States or to Alberta or to Eastern Canada. It may be two or three hundred growers that provide their products, and not knowing each other and not knowing who the exporter is. The gatherer buys product from various growers until he builds a load big enough to sell to what Patty calls 
an export corporation. There's probably at least a thousand people in BC gathering. They take away the need for the export corporation to know many different people, because the more people you know, the more risky life is. The distribution network is loosely organized, so by the time a shipment of marijuana approaches the border, no one really knows where it was grown or who collected the load. Even with all the beefed up enforcement, 80% of marijuana grown in Canada still ends up in the United States. And 15 billion American dollars flow back into Canada every year. BC bud marijuana coming out of Canada is, is the largest narcotic threat we have. The techniques that the smugglers have used has grown in sophistication over time. You're looking at very sophisticated compartments that are electronically controlled. At the Sumas port of entry, they had recently a cattle truck, which is a double-decker hauler. Both floors were hollowed out. That's a, that's a huge compartment accessed with hydraulic jacks, and they can even track them with GPS devices on their own loads. I think we know that if you increase the risks of doing business, in terms of both financial penalties and more significantly risks of incarceration. You're going to get a, a harder, tougher element of people involved in the game. Just like the Border Patrol, smugglers are upping the ante. Surveillance video from a joint U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, RCMP Sting, shows a helicopter owned by the UN, a notorious Vancouver street gang. The investigation revealed how money from massive marijuana sales was used to purchase cocaine from a Mexican cartel in L.A. The coke was smuggled back into Canada and sold on the streets of Vancouver. Because of tighter money laundering laws after 9-11, it's an easier transaction than cash. That takes away the entire benefit of the industry for British Columbians because it's not cash that's coming back into our economy. That cocaine was taken out of the United States market far more efficiently than the Drug Enforcement Administration or any police force in the United States could do. People were coming down and buying it. What we have is an evolution of the industry. You have a certain amount of organized crime and you have a lot of small ma and pa operations. What happens is, is organized crime is organized. It begins to expand and as it expands, there are many competing groups at the present time. These will eventually slug it out. Gradually, the entire industry is shifting from small-scale growers not in it only for the money to heavy-duty criminals playing for big stakes. If we're talking about volume, uh, then it is, you know, criminal motorcycle gangs, it is Vietnamese and Asian-dominated uh, organized crime groups in Canada and America. Organized crime is your largest producer. In Eastern Canada, First Nations are getting in on the action as well. With border access from native land in Ontario and Quebec, large volumes of pot are exported to the lucrative American market. Coming up, as the industry becomes more dangerous, small-time growers look to medical marijuana for salvation. If we had a regional distribution for medical marijuana, it could be 40 or 50 jobs, but it could also be a big tax uh, income for the province. 